Five channels with you. Israel strikes down a Syrian plane. President Obama's Jewish half-brother, remembering a legendary Jewish journalist, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. As we enter high holiday season, we wish all of you a happy and sweet new year. The big news this week, amid U.S.-led strikes on Syria, Israel has shot down a Syrian warplane, with the Israel Defense Forces claiming the plane had infiltrated Israeli airspace. It's a great example of the extremely complicated situation in the area right now and how Israel fits into it. A statement from Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Yaalon declared that the Syrian warplane had, quote, approached Israeli territory in the Golan Heights in a threatening manner and even crossed the border. Of course, the Syrian government believes the Golan Heights is occupied territory, captured by Israel in 1967 and annexed in 1981. That's a view seemingly shared to a degree by almost every country in the world, but especially by Arab states. And with the U.S. effort in Syria now including at least five Arab states as allies, of course, the question becomes further muddled. And giving a sense of how thoroughly complicated this all is, Syrian state television reported that Israel's shooting down of the Syrian warplane was, quote, in the framework of Israel's support for the terrorist Islamic State and the Al-Qaeda-affiliated Nusra Front. And amid all of this, the Iranian nuclear effort remains top of mind for Israel as efforts to build a coalition against the terrorist group ISIS and other U.S. needs in the region may well be balanced against the U.S. push against nuclear development in Iran. And most of these issues were also top of mind in the conference call President Barack Obama held with more than 900 hundred American rabbis, the Middle East was a dominant topic on the call, according to the JTA. But someone who says he has a distinct view into the mind of the president is his half-brother, a half-brother who's also Jewish and talked with Meredith Gansman. What does the president of the United States have in common with this Jewish artist? They're brothers. President Barack Obama and Mark Obama DeSanjo share a father. Rather than pursuing politics, DeSanjo is an artist and author living in China. And DeSanjo has a new book out, and Obama's journey, My Odyssey of Self-Discovery Across Three Cultures, to chronicle his story. But I think we're both trying to make a difference in our small ways. Mm -hmm. He's achieving, in a sense, a lot of the dreams that uh, my father had. And in a sense, I'm trying to do a little bit of that, but also trying to make some corrections. Born in Nairobi, DeSanjo's mother was Jewish. As an adult, he moved back to the United States, but after 9-11, he lost his job, took a severance package, and decided to move to China, where he had visited while studying as an MBA student at Emory University. He immediately bonded with the Chinese people, especially the younger and less fortunate. The first week that I came to China, I remember going up to the second floor of an orphanage because I wanted to teach the kids to play piano. And I remember a little baby, he grabbed my finger, you know, and you know babies, they don't let go. And he would not let go of my finger in this vast room with cots and, and also eerily silent and just two like neon lights up on the ceiling. And his big black eyes looked up at me. And at that moment, I knew that he wasn't thinking whether I was black or white or Jewish or Muslim or Christian or pink or whatever. Uh, or purple. He just wanted love and affection. But DeSanjo struggled to connect the pieces of his own diverse identity. Uh, when you uh, grow up uh, straddling and also involved in two cultures or even three cultures, it's a bumpy road because you have to find an identity. Mm -hmm. And I found out that the way to get that identity is to take the best parts of each of them mm -hmm. and absorb them. And then what happens is you form your own path as a result of that. But it has to be with passion. Mm -hmm. And music is my passion and art. He is a self-taught pianist and composer. For many years, DeSanjo hated the Obama name. It reminded him of his family's history with domestic violence. But when his half-brother, Barack, ran for president, that changed. Something inside me dissolved. All of that hard crust, which, you know, children of alcoholics, who can't remember a lot of the things, you know, which, uh, which I remembered. Mm -hmm. uh, I, there's a chapter in the book, which uh, chapter three, where I, I, try, I try not to think about it. It was very powerful to, um, about uh, the domestic violence in our family, and I try to shut it out. So, but the thing is that a part of me started to dissolve, and it, it was this tremendous movement which started to make it. Mm -hmm. 
uh, possible to embrace that name again. To see more from Mark Obama DeSanjo, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Longtime columnist for the Jewish newspaper Forward, Leonard Fine, recently passed away. A memorial service was held for Fine by the Forward, a business partner of the Jewish Channel, and Christian Neiden was there. A prolific literary Jewish life was celebrated last week at Manhattan's B'nai Jeshurun Synagogue as friends and family of the late author, Leonard Fine, gathered to recount and sing his praises. A month after his death at age 80, marking the end of the traditional mourning period known as the Shloshim. Fine was better known as label to his friends, including those at the Jewish Daily Forward, where he was a longtime columnist. B'nai Jeshurun Rabbi Rolando Madelon opened the night with his own thoughts about Fine, including his approach to giving advice to rabbis. He was very generous with his advice, uh, sometimes unsolicited, but most of the time solicited, and I'm really grateful for having uh, given me personally so much and having inspired all of us in a whole movement uh, of us who I think have looked up to him for so many years. That following Red Fine's work in publications like Moment Magazine, which he founded with Elie Wiesel, and even his secular thoughts made an impression on religious leaders of American Jewry, like former president of the Union for Reform Judaism, Rabbi Eric Yaffe. Label Fine was not a rabbi, or even someone who believed in God, but he was my Rebbe, and the Rebbe to my generation. So how to pay tribute to someone whose thoughts were held in such high esteem? Forward publisher and CEO Sam Norwich said an event that focused on spoken words rather than written ones was the best approach. It occurred to me that a shloshim for label could do worse than to consist of responsive readings from some of his columns of the last 24 years. Instead, his friends will speak and sing in their own words, in their own voices, of our teacher, our magid, our friend. One of those singing was forward editor-at-large J.J. Goldberg, who mixed in a few songs in English and Hebrew on his acoustic guitar with anecdotes about Fine, including his thoughts on Zionism in the latter decades of his life. I guess it was the 80s, and uh, I was asked to put together a, a volume, a history of uh, the labor Zionist youth movement in America, and I called Label because he'd been there through all of the generations and he had fabulous memories of the founding of the state. At the time in the 80s, he was uncomfortable um, identifying himself as a labor Zionist or as a Zionist, I think, in, in the sense that he hadn't made Aliyah. And he was still dealing with that, I guess. Um, later on, I guess he, you could say he became a label Zionist. To hear more from Leonard Label Fine's friends about his life, please tune in to the full broadcast edition of The Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. Finally, this week on Up Close, how economics and finance affect our lives and our country, and how to get more people talking about these numbers. If most of us were asked about the major financial scandals of recent years, we'd point to those that led to the economic downturn of 2008 to 2009. But there's been a boatload of scandal since then, as discussed by Bob Ivry, editor at Bloomberg News, in his book, The Seven Sins of Wall Street. But many times, the discussion of economic and financial problems leads people's eyes to glaze over, thinking they can't understand the numbers in play. But Oakland University professor Barbara Oakley thinks we can learn to do so pretty easily and explains how, in her book, A Mind for Numbers, How to Excel at Math and Science. And then finally, an interview from some time ago that sheds light on these matters. I go back and forth with Andrew Schiff, a member of a family that has gone to extreme measures to protest the economic structure here in America. He's a co-author on the re-release of a book his father wrote, How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes. Here are some of the highlights from my interview with Andrew Schiff. You and your brother, Peter, uh, and your father, Erwin, are pretty public figures in, in the larger economic debate mm -hmm. uh, that's going on in the country. Uh, with with this, not just with this book, but uh, your brothers were making some videos. Mm -hmm. You've been quoted in some articles, mm -hmm. and um, and your your father's been in and out of, of prison protesting mm -hmm. against uh, against the federal government's tax policies. And so, what are, what is your goal uh, in in trying to uh, to spread that message with this book? Well, you know, my dad's a kind of a very interesting figure, and he's certainly kind of a you know a hero of a lot of people. Uh, you could you could. 
you could paint him in a lot of different ways, but he's a man of very, very strong convictions. Um, and he, his driving philosophy has always been a libertarian philosophy that um, the best way to bring the most good to the most people is to allow them to pursue their freedom. And that, that includes their, both their social freedom and their economic freedom. And he always told me and my brother from a very early age how um, you know, maximizing freedom and minimizing government interference in the, in the economic um, marketplace could lift all boats and make, and make uh, the most good for the most people. Talking about entrepreneurs going out and gathering their own fish and then developing uh, their, own, uh, uh, their own means of production and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. But, uh, but uh, the, 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 the kind of obvious uh, uh, examples given about social safety net programs is that there's a great amount of risk that, as you note, there's a great amount of risk involved in doing these things, and the social safety net, by and large, smooths out that risk. Yeah. But here's what happens when the government gets involved in things. I mean, yeah. for instance, health care. Yeah. In the 1920s or 30s, we had health care in the system, yeah. you know, uh, in this country. Health care was affordable. I mean, it wasn't as nearly as technologically vast as it is today, but it, it, it consumed a minuscule percentage of our GDP. Healthcare could barely help you battle an infection. Well, in the 1920s or 30s it could. Certainly it could. Well, um, polio. You're at the average lifespan uh, in New York in City alone in the past 10 years has improved by... by actually, by the average lifespan that. of people born in 1930 and today has improved, but not not by a dramatic. And if, and if you, if you, if you uh, um, adjust for socioeconomic conditions, it's not that dramatically different from what was in 1930. Um, but you could go to the doctor. Doctors made house calls, and they didn't cost a lot of money. Right, you FDR got a house call when he was uh, when he was sick as a child, and take he ended up in a wheelchair. Sick, dragging yeah. your sick kid right. you when they're missing school into the doctor was was unheard of. Doctors came to you. You go to the doctor today. You walk in. You walk into their office. You see ten people before you see the doctor. You see a million of people filling out forms, and and you don't know what he's charging. He doesn't know what he's charging. That's all because of government. But being able to provide these services and being able to to uh, to provide something of value is uh, we're learning more and more to a significant degree a function of what family you were born to, in what city, in what in what. Uh, economic circumstances no. with what educational opportunities uh, I mean are you try I mean yeah. if you're trying to say that you know that's not fair and that and, and that, that well, it's not that, a question of not fair in the sense that I mean but it's interesting to have to be on the one hand making a top probably one and a half one percent salary mm -hmm. and then on the other hand to be suggesting uh, that um, that that the that the real problem in the economy is that there is too much government intervention on behalf of those who make less than thirty grand a year. Well, look, we have an economy now where you have a federal budget takes about twenty four, twenty five percent of well, if you, if you factor, yeah, about twenty five percent of the economy, and about uh, more than half of that is transfer payments. There's also at the same time there's there's there are m myriads of laws uh, it, that are designed to protect employees from employers uh, in terms of how you can turn around and sue your employers. Uh, you know, they just recently you know, basically made internships illegal. So you can't take an unpaid internship anymore, even if you want to. Uh, and as a result, in all these, the, the, these, these things that the government has done to protect the, 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 the people at the bottom end of the spe spectrum from the top, has ended up creating a situation where there is no economic growth. You can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish Channel on cable. You can also listen to the full audio of Up Close as a podcast available on iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, have a sweet new year and be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Ioplum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on Cable. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.